I'm going to show you how to create a dashboard with the Flex dashboard package. It's going to make laying out our dashboard really easy. And then we're going to integrate a little bit of Shiny into our dashboard to enable that interactivity for the user. So if you're in our studio, what you can do to, to get a Flex dashboard uh, template going is to first install, uh, install packages uh, and then Flex dashboard. And I already have it installed, so I won't, uh, I won't go through it. But if you didn't have it, you would go ahead and do that. Install Flex Dashboard. Run that. And then once you do that, you'll be able to go to File, uh, New File, and then R Markdown. And you can choose from a template to do a Flex Dashboard. Now, you can also choose to create a Shiny app. Um, which uh, is a little bit more complicated uh, and uh, kind of does the interactivity part, but we're going to stick to Flex Dashboard, which is easier to get started with, and then we'll integrate Shiny into that. So you could click on OK uh, to start up a new Flex Dashboard, and you'll see the same uh, metadata, the YAML at the top. It's going to uh, uh, show what the output should look like, and here the output is going to be a flex dashboard. So we're using the flex dashboard function from the flex da dashboard package, and there's a few options parameters that we can set here to change the uh, layouts. We won't worry about that for now. I'm just going to click knit so you can see what this is going to look like. Um, uh, I'll just overwrite my old one here, my flex. We'll go ahead and replace that. So when it runs, uh, we get a nice little uh, dashboard template here. Uh, or I could put a title, I didn't put one in there, and it's showing three charts, one primary chart and uh, two other charts uh, that I could show. And these could be charts, they could be tables. Uh, Flex Dashboard is super simple because uh, just by using uh, a version of uh, Markdown, essentially, uh, we're able to uh, specify the layout. So something like this, three pound signs in chart one, and three pound signs in chart two with um, R chunks after them would give us this layout over here. Two charts stacked on top of each other. We could also have um, some scrolling charts to be able to have uh, more than just you can see here in the chart one area by uh, telling it that we're going to do a vertical layout scroll. Uh, here's an example of where you might do a, a focal chart on the top and two charts below. Really, any, any, any design that you want, any layout you want is is probably possible to do in Flex Dashboard. You can even do it where you have a chart and then you have tabbed charts over here. That's nice if you might on one tab have the chart and the other tab have the table, the data, the, new, the number summary that goes behind uh, the chart. You could do that as well. Uh, so a, a lot of options for uh, just getting quick layouts without having to know anything about programming uh, a web page, programming an app like this, uh, the layouts are, are made easy for you. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get rid of the current layout that comes with the default template, and we'll work on our we'll work on our own layout here. We need a few packages for the type of data that we're going to put into the uh, uh, dashboard today. So I'm going to grab uh, Flex Dashboard, of course, but also we're going to use Tidyverse. We're going to use a little. Uh, ggtext and repel, and also shiny and shiny widgets, widgets and uh, tibble time for some rolling functions. And the options uh, side pen here is going to turn off uh, scientific notation. So we'll replace this and just have a few more packages that we want to come in. Um, now, if I run it now, uh, nothing will actually come up. Uh, nothing will be filled in our dashboard because I haven't specified a, a layout yet. We'll give it a name. Let's call it, uh, you know my dash uh, and we have some packages that will load and we also need to get some data right we want to show some data in our uh, in our dashboard so we'll grab uh, some data sources we've used in the past so here uh, we're going to load it into a global chunk uh, what this means is that when you publish your dashboard and it's online for anybody to be able to hit if you choose to make it open uh, then this global chunk would be data that's available for everybody. So whenever someone hits your dashboard, uh, this is the data that are available to them. And if one person's already spun up the dashboard, uh, I think everything uh, runs a little bit faster already. So we're going to read in uh, data from this CSV file from the New York Times. We've seen that previously in our uh, workshop series. And uh, we have in our files, we have a census file that I've already prepared. Now you could use the, um, 
the, the census API through the tidy census package to go and get the state and uh, county shape files and population data but we're just going to use the uh, the file that I've prepared uh, so we're going to just load that in let's do those two steps real quick when we do that now our environment is going to have uh, the uh, counties and uh, this would be the population and the shape file data the, ge the um, geometry for counties and states and then the New York Times ST is our actual COVID data I'm going to go back and click run on this uh, uh, chunk to make sure my, all my packages are loaded. Now one thing uh, I can show you is that I, I want to join uh, my COVID data with my state data uh, but if I show you what my uh, keys look like so in states it's the GOID now, this is a character you can see it's um, in uh, quotations and we have leading zeros for ones if I want to verify that I can do class um, to tell me the class of the GOID column in the states data set so states uh, dollar sign GOID and again it's telling me it's a character um, but if I want to look uh, and see what am I going to try to join it to in the New York Times uh, data I want to join it to the FIPS code and if I run that uh, these are actually uh, uh, numerals, and I can verify that by doing uh, class, and then in the FIPS column of the NYTST data frame, that's an integer, okay? So trying to merge those will fail a little bit because I'm trying to merge two different types. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my uh, GOID in the states into an integer, in a numeric here, and it takes away that leading zero and now I'm going to be able to, uh, if, I, if I actually change that, reassign it back to states, now I can join uh, New York Times data and then join the state data and join them by the FIPS column in New York Times, that's on our left side, and by the GOID column in the states data frame, which is on the right side, left, right. Uh, now we can join those two things together and I'm just going to assign it back to the NYT ST. I'll run that chunk. And now if I do uh, you know, head uh, NYT ST, right, it's going to show me my uh, show me a little bit of my data here where I have my uh, uh, case data that comes from the New York Times data and then I have my geometry and my population data. Here's my population column uh, and the geometry from the states data frame. All right, so now I have some data that you've seen before in this workshop series. Uh, so we have something that we can actually plot. Now we'll start by, I'll explain this code when I pull it over, by just creating a static plot. You could, if you wanted, in the, uh, in the, in your dashboard, just show a static plot. Uh, you beat an alternative to uh, creating an HTML report or a PDF. You could just have a dashboard that shows a static plot. And uh, what this is showing is that I want a new page of my, uh, of my dashboard to be called static. And on that page, I want there to be just one column. So I'm only going to show, um, you can see here, I'm going to show one uh, plot, and I'm going to title the United States. And everything that comes in the uh, R chunk below it is going to be what's visualized in that part of the column. I'm only showing one chart, so it's going to be a one page with one column showing one chart. So it's going to take up the whole space. But if I wanted, I could also, we're going to make a reactive page. Nothing will be on it right now, but I'll say that after uh, defining what's on my static page, I can come down here and say, well, I'm going to have a page that's called reactive. And uh, so let me, uh, let me actually take away the R chunk here. I'll, I'll just actually... Uh, set it to evaluate equals false. We don't actually uh, show what's in here. I'm going to knit this together. And what we're going to see is the layout defined. Uh, on one page, it's going to be called static. On the other page, it's going to be called reactive. And I have uh, a blank chart space for something called United States. No chart, nothing's here. And on the reactive page, and there's certainly nothing because I didn't put anything after that uh, page definition. So my dashboard is, is pretty simple. Two pages and actually no data or no visualization yet. 
if I wanted, I could come back up here to my uh, my uh, my YAML, my metadata, and I could change the output definition a little bit and say that I want to use something called the bootstrap theme. Let me do it for you and it'll show you what is it's going to look like. It's going to change it to a more minimalist style that I like. Everything else is going to be the same, uh, uh, except that I guess I've added a placeholder for a logo. If I wanted a, an image, a logo file, to appear in the top left, I could put the path to that image file right here. I'm not going to define a logo, but that's a placeholder for where it would go. I'll knit this together and you'll see that the, the theme, the styling of the dashboard has changed to the bootstrap style. Uh, may not be your preference, maybe you like the blue instead. Uh, you can change the blue. Uh, it's pretty easy with this theme option, uh, this theme parameter in YAML, to uh, set it to something that's pre-made. Now if you're still not happy, you really want to brand it to be looking like your organization and maybe you want to look like DGHI, we could add some CSS, have it, have it add a load of CSS file where we go in and we define all of those colors and fonts. We're not going to do that in this example, but it, if you know what you're doing around CSS, it's not hard. Um, if you don't know what you're doing around CSS, using some built-in preloaded themes would be the way to go. Okay, so we can go back to the static column, the static plot that we're creating. And we're going to do a little bit of wrangling of our data. Nothing new to you. We're going to start with our New York Times COVID data. We're going to mutate the, uh, create a new date. Uh, well, actually, there is an existing date column. We're just going to change it. So we're going to use the Lubridate package to um, uh, uh, parse all these dates and put them into something that R can recognize. If I just look at New York Times ST and the date, uh, you'll see that these are actually characters. And character strings. R doesn't recognize anything other than this is equal to 2020-03-20. It doesn't recognize that's a that's a, a March 20th of 2020. Uh, but if we do lubricate on it, it will. Right, so now I can uh, run this and it's going to show me uh, down here below that uh, this is now a proper date column. R recognizes that uh, that's a date. Uh, and all I'm doing is grouping by date, and uh, what I want to do is sum across for all the states and territories in the U.S. Uh, for each date, so January 1st, January 2nd, January 3rd, I want to sum across all of those uh, administrative units, states and territories, and uh, sum the number of deaths that occurred each day. And um, we're going to get multiple values for every state because we have, this is a long data file, so we only need to keep the first version of it. They're all once we sum the deaths, they're all going to have the same value. So distinct, we'll keep the first version. We'll ungroup it because we don't want to do the next step by date, uh, and we'll create a daily deaths variable that does sort of a lag function here to take the difference between today's value and yesterday's value. So that'll create a new little data set called DF deaths. We've done that. Uh, we've done that before. So if I run that. Let's see, so now we can look at, uh, there it is, uh, head uh, df deaths. And uh, we, have, uh, we have our new variables here that we created daily, daily deaths. Now we can do a simple plot of that, so plotting df deaths, plotting our new data set. On the x-axis will be date, on the y it will be our new daily count of deaths. Uh, overall in the U.S. We'll make a, uh, a bar chart. The difference here between geom call and geom bar is that this version, geom call, is taking pre-summarized data. And that's my preference, is to, in a previous step, do whatever manipulation you want to the data so then you can plot it directly. You could also use geom bar and, uh, and summarize the data in the ggplot step, but I think it's easier to do outside of ggplot. Uh, we'll give it a title and a subtitle, and we'll do some basic theming uh, for, the, for the plot. Now when we knit this together, now on our static page, in the space we had for our plot, we're going to have uh, just a static plot. That's going to show us uh, uh, a chart of uh, deaths in the U.S. Now, 
okay? So it's not showing here. If I go back and think, well, why? I just told it to do it, so why isn't it showing? I've left my eval to false. So R is skipping over this when it knits my, uh, when it knits my uh, dashboard. So I could set this to true, or since true is the default, I can just get rid of it altogether and, and knit again. And now uh, I should have a plot here in my, in my dashboard. And I do. So here's our daily uh, sum, our daily count of deaths uh, over time across the U.S. and its territories. Okay, so our static plot is done. Now we want to move on to make something reactive. In that static plot, we weren't able to make any changes and have the plot react to our changes, right? There's no inputs. I can't do anything to interact with this plot. Now, if I wanted, I could have uh, used a, um, a plotly chart where I could have uh, hovered over the bars to see the values or something like that. Uh, that would have made it interactive. But the interactivity I'm talking about is actually being able to make new selections. So saying, well, I don't want, uh, I don't want the standard linear uh, increase here. I want uh, exponential uh, y-axis. I need to have a toggle to change between the two. That's the interactivity that we can add with uh, a little bit of shiny. We're partly set up because, uh, well, to make, to make this uh, a shiny dashboard, we need to add one other piece to our um, YAML, our metadata, and that's to add this runtime shiny. And that's going to uh, let us use the shiny engine to uh, be able to create a little app that's embedded in our Flex dashboard template. So we added that piece. And to make those changes, you need to give people a place that they can change the inputs. And we're going to do that in our sidebar. I'm going to grab that and put it before the uh, static page. And so what this is going to do, it's going to create a bar on the left side of our dashboard where I'm going to be able to choose some inputs and make some selections. It's not the only place you can put selectors. Uh, but it's a really useful one uh, for a dashboard layout. So now, everything else is going to be the same, but we're going to have this uh, bar on the side, which is our sidebar. Now, when I make these changes, I make some selections. Nothing's actually happening. I didn't connect it to my plot in any way. This is just going to be a static plot. Uh, it's going to be in their reactive page where I'm going to make some connections. Nothing's there now because we didn't put anything there. Uh, but these are... Uh, some nice uh, selectors. Here's a drop down. Here's a multi select where I'm feeding in a list of states and I can make, uh, I can make, sele it make selections. It follows me as I type. So I could say north and uh, pick Carolina. Uh, I could change, I want to do some rolling functions. So I could change the rolling window. I could change the axis. I could say whether it's per capita data or not. You can think of a lot of different inputs you might want to give someone, uh, your reader. Uh, the ability to change what's being plotted. You could also plot inputs on a plot by plot basis. So below here I could have put some of these inputs, but the sidebar is a really nice area to do that. So let's take a look at what goes into the sidebar. Uh, so here is the, um, the outcome selector. And the outcome selector has two options, cases and deaths. And if I come back to here, here's where it's defined. So I'm using the select input, which is the dropdown, and I'm calling it outcome, and I'm going to reference this later. Anytime I want to reference what uh, the user selects in that dropdown list, I'm going to call it uh, outcome, because that's the name I'm giving to this list. What the user sees on the page is outcome colon. It's like the label that appears above it, so outcome colon, whatever you want it to appear as. And my choices are going to be cases and deaths. So on the left is what appears for the user. On the right is what appears for my data set. It can be whatever you want. Uh, I just chose it to be lowercase uh, cases and deaths to match what's currently in my data set. And the selected parameter tells it what should the default be. When a user first opens the page, it's set to show cases. Uh, so that's my selector, uh, my dropdown. Um, here's another one that comes from the Shiny Widgets package, a select si a select ties input, and I'm giving it has a parameter called multiple true, which means that we can make 
multiple state selections in this case. Remember, so this is the one where I can pick nothing, or I can pick mo one thing, or multiple things. And this comes from the uh, shiny widgets. Let's find it. Shiny widgets package, which is a nice one. So you can install shiny widgets by, uh, I think you have to do it from, let's see, can you do it from CRAN? Yeah, you can do it from CRAN. So install packages, shiny widgets, and here are the widget widgets that are available. I could use a, uh, I, I like these toggle switches sometimes to turn something on or off, uh, icon, uh, radio buttons, uh, things like that. So they add a few more uh, options than your, than your standard then your standard selectors. So here's another way to view uh, everything they have. Everything they have here. Knob input as well. So I'm going around a dial. Uh, so that's one of the ex examples from Shiny Widgets, and uh, we're going to call this selector uh, Highlight States. And the label we're going to give it in the dashboard is Highlight, and then uh, multi-select in parentheses. Now the interesting thing is the choices. Where do you get your choices from? Well, we don't want to. I could give. I could type a list of all 50 states and territories, but that would take a while. So we know that in the New York Times data set, we have a list of state and territory names, and we're going to make just a little pipe right in here. And what this pipe does is, it's going to uh, look in the New York Times data, and then give us a, a list of states and territories that's distinct. So basically, one each state appearing only once. We want them to appear in alphabetical order, so the A's are going to come first with our range state. And then we just want a list. We don't want the whole data frame of the New York Times data. We just want the state variable because we want a vector of state and territory names. So if I run that, you'll see that what we get back is just a vector of state and territory names. So uh, by putting this here, we're saying that the choices for our multi-select list come from the New York Times data uh, where we do a little manipulation to show what that list should be. And I've decided that uh, you, could, you could have nothing selected at first, but I'm saying that uh, New York should be the state that I show first, and, and you could have put multiple things here. I have another uh, selector, uh, and it's the rolling window where I'm sort of a numerical slider here. And I have a slot, so that one's called the slider input. And for my data, I'm calling it role. So in the code, it's going to be referenced as role. My label for my users are, it's called rolling window. I'm setting the minimum to one, the maximum to 14. And the value that's going to be on initially is seven. And I'm going to step through one to 14 by one. If I didn't want users to be able to go from one to two, I could put my steps at five. You know, and it would have been, um, from you know one to fifteen by fives, something like that. And, that, and then I have two more drop down my select inputs. Uh, I have a drop down. It's called axis. It's going to be whether it's a linear or exponential axis. And then I have a drop down called per cap, that will be where my user selects whether they want uh, my data to be normalized by uh, per capita or no normalization at all. So again, we haven't connected this to anything. We've just defined our selectors. So now we need to go in and actually uh, connect this to our plot and our data. Here's the static plot that we created previously. So now we need to define something under our reactive. So I'll go uh, to my uh, example that I've put together already, and I'll grab the code that I'm going to show you, walk you through. It's a little bit more complicated. There are easier ways to do this. There are more sophisticated ways to do this. But I'm going to show you a rather verbose way. It's because I do think it's a little bit easier to learn. It might just be me. Uh, that uses if statements. So here, under my reactive page, I'm creating a space for one plot. I'm going to call that plot state level. And I have one chunk under here that's going to define my plot. Now. Defining the plot was easier for my uh, static. Uh, I just, in the code chunk here, I just used ggplot code like we've done before, and nothing special, just prints the ggplot uh, right in that space that I created for it in the template. The reactive is a little bit different because now I'm embedding uh, uh, a Shiny app, essentially, into this space. So that means I have to uh, work within the Shiny framework. 
And one of the things we need to know is that Shiny uses things called reactives because uh, the app needs to be listening to changes that the user is making in our sidebar here. So whenever a new selection is made, we need to go back and maybe rerun the data or recreate the plot or both. So Shiny uses the re these reactives to be listening to changes the user might make in these inputs. So one thing that's different is instead of just uh, defining our uh, deaths uh, wrangling and assigning it back to DF deaths, we're actually putting something in here first that's called reactive. So it's reactive and then it's a function, so it starts with uh, an open parentheses, and then we have a, an open bracket to define what's happening in here. And that goes all the way down to here. So this closes my bracket, this closes my function. So it's all of this is being defined as uh, DF deaths. And when you're using the reactive function, DF deaths is no longer an object. It's actually being created as a function called DF deaths. So Shiny's making it easy because we haven't gone over how do you create a function. Shiny's doing that for us with another function called reactive. So everything in here is going to be part of our DF deaths function that we're going to show you how to use later. So inside this function, we are creating another function called roll mean. We're going to use rollify from the tibble time package. And we're going to say that the, uh, we want to roll the mean. And the window on that mean is going to come from our slider input called roll. So all of our inputs from the sidebar uh, have, they have this prefix input dollar sign. So it's telling Shiny that what comes after it is actually the name of one of our inputs from our uh, sidebar. And we're going to use the input called roll. If I scroll back up just to remind you here that uh, I have a slider input called roll, and it's the rolling window. It takes a value of from 1 to 14. So this is a placeholder for what the user might select. And, and the default, the initial one is set to 7. So initially when you open up the, the dashboard, it's going to be set to 7. And so a window of 7 would mean moving through your data set from January 1st to January 7th, um, it, would, uh, it would use that as the 7-day period for the mean. Then the window would slide over by 1 from the 2nd to the 8th, and then from the 3rd uh, uh, to the 9th. And it would take the mean of that window at each time point. So we're going to define that function called rolling mean, and it's going to listen to changes the user makes. And then we're going to do the same type of wrangling with a few other pieces that uh, weren't possible. We need some variables uh, for uh, the rolling uh, deaths and the rolling per capita, just in case we want to show those. Uh, from our selectors. These weren't necessary in the static plot because you couldn't make any selections like this. So we have one step that we, you know, the steps that we saw before were these, and then we're going to add a few other additional, a few other additional steps here. And in our, in our wrangling, you're going to see that we're going to bring in a few more places where we listen to the user. Let's see where that is. Uh, yeah, highlight states. So, <clears throat> We'll work our way down to here, but this is another place where we're listening to the user to make a selection of the states. We're going to have a plot where we highlight the lines of certain states. You can select no states, uh, you can select uh, one state, or you can select multiple states. So highlight states is this uh, selection. Remember, it looks like this window here. And the default is just to select New York, but we could select nothing. Uh, we'll say Alabama, Alaska. So this is the select input, and so what's happening here in our deaths is uh, we are listening to whether or not, uh, we're sorry, which states should be highlighted. So let me walk through what's happening. We're, we're starting with our New York Times data set. We're making that change to make the data proper date. We're grouping by state, and then we're making a few death count variables. One is our standard daily deaths. One is our daily deaths per capita, where we're dividing our daily deaths by the, uh, the estimate of the population in that state and multiplying by 100,000. Uh, 
we're making a variable called daily deaths roll, which is taking a, a rolling mean of the daily deaths variable. Something similar, we're taking the rolling mean, but it's the per capita version. So we're going to roll the mean, but we're going to, instead of rolling the, uh, the raw deaths, we're going to roll the uh, per capita deaths variable. Then we're going to filter the show uh, where daily deaths are greater than or equal to three. So states aren't going to appear until their, uh, uh, the first day where they had more than three deaths in a day. And we are going to uh, label our days uh, so we can get an order. So if a state appears 50 times, it's going to, the first date is going to be one, and the second day is two, all the way to 50. And for our labels, we're going to use ggtext here, and this is just to be able to put the state label, so the state name, on the last day. So it's going to count the days, and if there are 50 days for Alabama, it's going to look and say, if the day in our data set is equal to the max days, which for, let's say Alabama might be 50, uh, so if, if the day is equal to 50, then it's going to print the state name in a variable called label. Otherwise, it's just going to print an NA so that we don't actually try to label uh, that date. Then we're going to stop doing things by state, uh, so we ungroup it. Then we're going to create a new variable called highlighted. So this is going to say when we make our plot, the line is either going to be colored and made a little bit bigger by whether or not it's in our list of states that the user wants to highlight. So this is saying if else, if the state in our data is in the list that the user selected, right, so the user's making that selection, if the state name appears in this uh, uh, list that the user selected, then we're going to give the highlighted variable a value of 1, otherwise we're going to give it a value of 0. You could have said yes, you could have said no, you could have said anything. Uh, but I often make uh, ones and zeros to mean yes and yes and no. So highlighted is now going to be a variable where state names, state data, appear with ones or zeros in the column for whether or not they should be uh, highlighted in our chart. And uh, we're going to go in and uh, we certainly want all of our uh, uh, states to be highlighted if uh, if they have a highlighted value of 1. So this is saying, create a new variable called label, and if the variable highlighted is 0, just give it an NA so it doesn't appear highlighted. Otherwise, uh, give it the label name that we defined earlier. So we did this all for deaths, and we're going to do the same thing for cases using the case data instead of the, the death data. And the reason we need both is because we're giving the user the option to plot cases or deaths. Right? So we're doing this over again, but for cases. So we're going to create another function, but this time it's called DF cases. So it's a reactive. It's going to listen just like DF deaths. Everything else is the same. So that was the data wrangling piece. Now we're going to do our plot piece. And the way that Shiny works is that we are creating our output, which is going to be our plot. So this is a, a reactive. So it's, it's where our plot is going to be rendered. It's kind of long. We'll go through it. So all of this is our reactive, and this is going to be called plot state. So the output of all of this is called plot state. So we create the reactive. It's going to listen to those changes the user makes. And then we have a one-line command that says we're going to plot that output. Remember, the output we just defined it as called being called plot state, and it's going to take up the whole space. So in our reactive, we define what our plot should look like. We give it a name, plot state, and then we plot that object in plot output. And so now we're going to have a plot that's going to be reactive to user input. So the first thing we need to do in render plot, our function render plot here, is to use our function dfdes that we created in the previous step in DF cases and assign it back to something you can assign it to anything. I'm going to use the same name over again because this is a function, this is an object. So it's going to create an object called DF deaths. It's going to create an object called DF cases. So it makes this, this, all of this available to our plot reactive. And here you're going to see me using a series of if statements. Again, there are easier ways to do this, use less code, but I think this is pretty easy. 
the first if, the first point, decision point in our decision tree, if you want to think about it that way, is did the user want to see us plotting deaths or cases? So if the input selector called outcome, right, which was uh, uh, this one here, if the user selected deaths, then do one thing. Otherwise, they must have selected cases. It's the only other option. So we can come back here. If the outcome that the user selected from the list is deaths, then we're going to work with the deaths data. Let's follow this down until it closes. Not yet. Here we go. So I can click it here, and that's where we have lots of other nested ifs there. So we see other brackets. But if I go back up and I put my uh, cursor here at this uh, close bracket, our studio is going to help me out and show me that this is the bracket it's closing. And that's the one I want. So basically anything that appears between these two brackets is what we would do if the user selected deaths from the list. So that's if, if the user selected deaths, so if basically if something is true, do this, else do this other thing. Right? So that closes that reactive. So that closes the, uh, the, the else here. So if deaths, do the top thing. Else, do everything that follows here. Now if we had more conditions, we could have said else, and then put another if in here with a logical statement to be evaluated. But ours is easy, because it's either deaths or cases. So if the user didn't select deaths, it must be something else. It must be the other thing, which are cases. So let's work on the deaths section here. So if the user did select deaths, then it would go through and say, oh, we come to another branch. Here it's if the user selected that we want to show per capita data. Remember we had a, um, uh, a reactive here called per cap, where a user could select that it should be per capita or no normalization. In per capita, I've, I've said is called PC or none. So we're going to evaluate on whether the input here is PC or not. So I'll come back down here. Is the input equal to PC? If yes, then uh, we're going to do this. See how this closes this section. So if that's true, if the user selected for it to be per capita, we're going to do the plot this way. Otherwise, we're going to do the plot this way. So in both cases, we're defining AES one way here if they selected per capita, and in a different way if they selected it here. And the main difference is, if they selected per capita, we're going to pull the variable that's the per capita data. If they didn't, we're going to pull the data that's uh, just the uh, non-normalized version of that. The other difference is, uh, in the per capita version, the subtitle is here to be set to, say, per 100,000, um, and in the non-normalized data, there's no subtitle. So if they selected per capita, it's going to do the, it's going to make a different selection for the uh, uh, variable. Again, there's an easier way to do that, but this is the I think the clearest without introducing a new too new of an idea. Uh, and now we're going to uh, do something that applies to the plot regardless of what a user selects. Uh, we've defined our plot as p, so we're going to pick it up here and say. Um, and reassign it back to P and say P plus, so we're going to add some more layers. So no matter what you selected, we're going to do a line plot. Um, we're going to have uh, gray and blue. We're going to have the, uh, the size of our lines being either a size 1 or a size 3, depending on what you pick in a later step. We're going to have our uh, uh, GG, uh, geome text repel from the GG repel uh, package. Uh, that's going to label and space our uh, plot labels out a little bit, and we're going to have some basic theming. We have another branch that if the input selector for the axis was set to be exponential, then we're going to take our plot and we're going to print it with uh, the uh, log 10 scale on the y-axis. Otherwise, we're just going to print our plot. All right, so uh, this is... Uh, this is our last point of listening here. And if we get to this point, like if our, if our user did not select death, so they select cases, then we would have done the same thing, the same series of steps down here. We would have then 
or would then evaluate, well, is the, uh, the data they want, do they want it normalized, do they want it per capita or not? And uh, the same theming here, and do they want it, the access to be exponential or not? And then we close that reactive. So the plot is now made, it's set up to listen to those placeholders for whenever they're changed. And uh, then we're gonna plot our output so this is plot state. This is what we called everything above. So when we run this, here's what we see. We're going to have our sidebar that's uh, uh, still here with our inputs. In our static plot, we didn't connect any of this to our uh, input selector, so nothing's changed here. But in our reactives, now we have that plot that we're highlighting certain states. So here we're highlighting New York. Now listen to us. Uh, we took away the highlighting for New York and it's gone. So we could choose Alaska and maybe North uh, Carolina. And uh, now both of those states are highlighted. I'll bring back New York because it's an easy one to see, unfortunately. Uh, new, uh, new York. We can change our rolling window. So right now, what it's showing is a seven day rolling mean. We could go back to show just, a, you know, uh, just using the one day. And so it's pretty noisy. We could really smooth it out, which I wouldn't recommend to do a two-week uh, rolling mean. And here's back to where it was to begin with. Here our axis is a linear scale, but we could change it to be an exponential scale instead. And we could also choose to plot uh, per capita data instead of uh, uh, the raw data here. And so now we're showing per capita data on an exponential scale. Uh, with Alaska, North Carolina, and New York highlighted with a seven-day rolling window showing cases where we could switch to deaths if we want. Uh, one thing I noticed, I've actually made a mistake, is that look at the plot title. Whether I go cases or deaths, uh, it's still the label is deaths. So I'd actually need to go back um, and uh, print, a new, uh, print a new title. So we, let's do that real quick. And we can look where we define the label for if it's deaths. Uh, here's our title, uh, daily COVID-19 deaths. But if we come down here to where we're no longer dealing with death data, uh, we're dealing with case data, we could say daily COVID-19, here's the, our, where our title is defined. Uh, I believe these are confirmed uh, cases. I can run that again and now, uh, if I select cases instead of deaths, uh, let's see, did I get that? Cases instead of deaths, uh, it's appearing as uh, deaths in both places. So let me go back and see where I might have made a mistake here. Um, ah, so this is, I, I changed the label uh, for the title, I changed the title only if they selected per capita. So I actually need to do it for the per capita and the non per capita version. So let's say um, uh, daily confirmed uh, uh, cases here and daily confirmed uh, uh, cases down here as well. Daily cases with coronavirus. Now my, my titles are different. Uh, maybe I'll make them standard here. Uh, that's not a great way to, we should, we should make them uh, be the same. And let's look up and check if there were deaths, daily deaths with coronavirus, daily COVID-19 deaths. Let's make these uh, the same uh, in both of our death plots as well. So I think I should be uh, standard across these two now. Let's go back and take a look. And there is an easier way to do that so we don't have the opportunity to make these kind of mistakes. Uh, but for now, it's just fine. And now we have COVID-19 confirmed cases. If we switch to deaths, daily COVID-19 deaths. And it's, this, it's that way, whether we choose linear or exponential, our titles remain the same. And uh, if I go back to cases, daily confirmed 19 cases. Uh, if I wanted to, I could add a subtitle here that now we're using the exponential uh, uh, y-axis if we wanted to highlight that to the user uh, if we so choose to do that. So there you go. A quick introduction to Flex Dashboard which makes creating, getting a 
dashboard up and running as simple as going to file, uh, new file, R markdown, and picking from the template flex dashboard and getting a simple uh, uh, template up that you can then modify. But also showing you how, if you want to go beyond simple, we can tell it, uh, let's also make shiny the back end here. Uh, load the shiny package and shiny widgets if you want a few extra nice input selectors. And then instead of just uh, creating a basic plot as we did in our static, using the concept of reactives from the shiny package to make our use our inputs as placeholders where these become functions so that R is actually listening to changes that the user is making and then we pass those on to the plot to make it available to the plot which is also becomes a reactive so the plot's going to change not just the data wrangling and both pieces are listening uh, for changes that the user's making and then those changes get output here and printed in uh, a nice dashboard. If we wanted, uh, we could share this with somebody uh, in a real simple way uh, by coming over here to our files and we could grab our week eight, this is the file I've been working with, and we could go to more and we could go to export. This would download it to our computer and we could just send this to somebody. We could send them our week eight uh, uh, file. And we'd also need to send them the um, the census of our data or have them configure it so we could just pull from the uh, API. That's what I would do if I was sending it to somebody. I wouldn't use my local file. I would actually, up in here, uh, where the data are grabbed, I would write it so it pulls from the census API. But if you didn't do that, you could also sense them, you know, this file here. And when they open it in their version of RStudio, it would run on their local computer. They'd have a little app running. But a lot of times you don't want to be sending these files to people. You want to just make it available on a website that anybody can hit or you know, hit with some login, some authentication if you wanted. And that's where you could hit this publish button. And uh, we could choose to um, publish it to our pubs, I believe, um, or our Studio Connect. Uh, the other one that I would recommend we publish to is um, uh, shinyapps.io. I'll go into my account here, but I'll show you instead. Uh, this is another product from our studio, where uh, you can make it so that there's your app becomes a, a website. They have a free tier, which lets you make five of these per account. It has 25 active hours. I believe it's set up so that anytime someone loads your web page, it creates a default session that's going to be 15 minutes, whether they sign up for a few seconds or for the full 15 minutes, it would count as 15 minutes of your 25 active hours per month. So if you're just creating something for your team or um, an app that's not going to get a ton of traffic, uh, you'd, get, you'd get pretty far with the free account. Otherwise, for $9 a month, it looks like you can have more applications and more hours and a little bit of uh, premium support, all the way up to uh, you know, professional and enterprise accounts, I believe. Uh, so this is one way you could do it. For me, uh, I... Uh, for my courses, our studio is kind enough to make our um, studio connect available. So if you were an educator and you uh, were able to have access to a server you could set up on you know, Amazon or one of the uh, cloud vendors or at your university, you could install our studio connect on the server and you could make it so uh, people are actually going to your branded website and in the background our studio connect is running and you would just simply publish uh, from your app you would publish to your our studio connect server and then a lot more people can hit it at the same at the same time uh, and you have kind of unlimited hours of people being able to use your app so uh, uh, publishing can be as easy as just sharing a file or putting it online, again, without having to know really anything about publishing on the web. That's what our studio has really made easy for us here with, uh, with these apps and these distribution platforms is we can focus on the data science without having to focus on uh, the computer science right, or, the, or, the, or the web publishing. So that's it for today. Uh, definitely dig in and try to make your own dashboard. You'll be surprised how easy it is. Uh, Shiny might give you headaches from uh, time to time, but I believe there is a uh, Shiny um, book, 
Let me see. Uh, Hadley is writing a book now um, called Mastering Shiny. So this is an online book that chapters are coming along as they're uh, being written. If you wanted to learn Shiny, uh, check out Mastering Shiny. There's also lots of tutorials out there uh, to get you started.